Welcome to Food and Facilities, an online show for West Coast Industrial Solutions Magazine. Our goal is to cultivate knowledge to feed the world by focusing our quarterly trade issues on safety, compliance, and innovation within manufacturing, agriculture, food processing, and food and beverage industries. This episode, we will be discussing food labeling requirements for manufacturers and updated compliance dates. Welcome to Food and Facilities. I'm Tara Sweeney with West Coast Industrial Solutions Magazine. And please make sure to subscribe on our website for content like we'll be discussing today and more. We have a print and digital version. Go to wcismag.com forward slash subscribe for manufacturing, food and beverage, food processing, and agricultural information. Here will be the overview of what we will be discussing today. We will be discussing food labeling requirements for manufacturers and updated compliance dates, how COVID-19 is affecting microbreweries, research and development tax incentives, and hand washing and why it's sanitation that saves lives. First up is food labeling requirements for manufacturers and updated compliance dates. This content is thanks to Mannix Consulting and Dr. Michael Shabaka. He's the Director of Sales and Innovation Excellence at Manex, and they have infinite experience in how to help manufacturers of all types. They're part of the California Manufacturing Association, so make sure to reach out if you have any questions about the content covered today at mshabaka at manexconsulting.com. Here's an example of the original label that the FDA had required for nutrition facts and the new label. As you can see, the serving size is now larger. Daily values have been updated. And as we will be covering today, added sugars are now required to be noted along with vitamin D and potassium. Here are the compliance dates for added sugars and these new label requirements. So in May 20, on May 27, 2016, the FDA required that manufacturers making over 10 million in produce and food sales be compliant as of July 26, 2018. And those with less than $10, $10 million be compliant by July 26 of 2019 this year. Whereas this year, um, un over $10 million were supposed to be compliant in January, and those under $10 million are going to be required to be Jan compliant in January of next year. There are four exceptions to these compliances. So if the company makes under 500000 or under 50000 in food sales, if they are medical foods, or if they have insignificant nutrients such as coffee beans or tea leaves. Now we will be going over what constitutes an added sugar. So under section 5, which nutrients must newly be declared and what changes have been made to nutrients previously required or allowed to be declared states that added sugars are defined as the following. So during processing they are added, or they are free, mono and disaccharides, syrups and honey, excess from concentrated fruit and vegetable juices, or individually packaged products such as table sugar. Not under the definition are 100% juice concentrates, fruit spreads made with juice concentrates, sugar alcohols, and naturally occurring sugars in dairy. Lactose is not one of those. If you have any questions, please make sure to reach out to Mannix Consulting. They will be of great help to you if you have any questions about these regulations and more for food processing and manufacturing. Reach out to Dr. M. Shabaka at mshabaka 
at manxconsulting.com or go to manxconsulting.com or call 925-807-5100 or their corporate line 877-336-2639. One of our sponsors today is Fine Print Plus. Mention that you saw them on food and facilities and you will get 100 free direct mail postcards with purchase or 15% off an order of 250 or more of those direct mailer postcards. They're also capable of translating so your message can be bilingual. Make sure to call them at 559-237-4747 Email them at graphics at fineprintplus.com or request a quote through their website at fineprintplus.com forward slash quote. Next we will be discussing how COVID is affecting microbreweries with my guest Philippe Cornet, PCQI, and here's a video of our discussion. Can you hear me? I can, Tara. Am I picking up now? Yes. <laughs> oh, excellent. <Yes>. Finally. <laughs> it's nice to finally be able to actually hear you while we're doing this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you to introduce yourself so that any of our listeners can know more about you before we tell them the hazards of being a microbrewery in this current climate. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. My name is Philippe Cornet. I am president, CEO, and sole employee of Quality and Compliance Solutions, LLC. It's a consulting firm that helps small to mid-sized businesses get their paperwork together and meet the expectations of the regulators and their certifying bodies. Do you want to share any of your contact information with everybody so they can know where oh, to reach you? Uh, you can find me at LinkedIn. It's my first and last name, Philippe Cornet. Uh, you can also contact me on my company's website, which is the letter Q, the word and, cs.com. That's for Quality and Compliance Solutions. What made you want to address microbreweries specifically? Well, microbreweries and I have a special history. It, it was actually my first job in the food and beverage industry. So it was at a microbrewery, a little place called Diamond Bear in Little Rock, Arkansas, and yeah, it it's always had a special place in my heart. It's also the reason I got interested in food science. Not coincidentally, was the craft beer movement was at its height at the time when I was just starting to enter college, and I got I got bitten by the fermentation bug there and started to homebrew and brew competitively. I got my beer judge certification. I think that was back in two thousand eight, and I was still fairly active in the community at that time. So, yeah, microbreweries have really been an uh, integral part of my career. And uh, more recently, I've, I've uh, assisted one much larger brewery set up a satellite operation. Yeah, it just continues to be part of my wheelhouse. Craft beer is the only segment of the, the market that's really experiencing growth right now. I, I think that's an important point about all this is the craft beer market is the future of sales. These micro and nano breweries, they're the ones who set the trends. And if you look at the industry analysis, it's craft beer and imports that are leading the growth. It's not big beer. It's not domestic lager that's doing it. It's craft beer. Domestic lager sales have been declining pretty regularly since 2016. It's important to note that the shift in consumer preferences has been pretty hard and, and towards the side of craft beer. In my state, brewing is huge business. Oregon is home to 281 breweries, and those 281 breweries are operated by 228 companies. And these companies are mostly small enterprises, and they generate a lot of economic activity directly and indirectly. In 2017, in my state, it accounted for $4.49 billion. So it's, it's a pretty big blow when draft sales all of a sudden dry up. That's a lot of Oregonians that are going to be impacted. I think it's about 31,000 or so. 
I know that you have a wider audience than just Oregon. California has a huge beer scene. I can think of four or five fantastic California breweries off the top of my head. And California is, we have what, 8 million people here. You guys have 20 some million. So if all things were equal, you know, you'd have that many more times revenue coming in through the beer industry. We do have a pretty big microbrewery scene locally in Central California, too. Some of the microbreweries I'll be bringing up as we talk about the different points. According to the Brewers Association statistics from 2018, California was number one in the U.S. with over 900 craft breweries. And then the economic impact of its industry was generating $7.345 billion in 2018. So, yeah, we're pretty big. <laughs> The craft beer scene is a draw for tourists. I was as surprised as anyone when people started coming to Portland in droves. Our our craft beer scene up here brings a lot of people from out of town. We have Oregon Brewers Festival up here every year, and it's a it's a huge draw. It's the largest independent micro and craft brewery festival in the United States. In California, one of the biggest breweries I think of is Sierra Nevada down there in Chico. And I know that when I'm in the Chico area, I become a beer tourist when I'm not working. Sierra Nevada is one of those I'm going to check out. But along the way, me and other beer tourists are likely to discover other little places like Feather River or uh, Secret Trail. These kinds of smaller producers are, you know, where you go after you've visited the big guys and you can try some different, more obscure styles that get a little more cutting edge and get even a little closer to the people in the community because it's not the Sierra Nevada tap room where the locals are going to go drink. It's it's going to be these little places, these artisan producers. This is where you're going to find some real treasures. Preserving the scene is a big deal for tourism and keeping tourism going in your area. What are some ways you are seeing microbreweries adapting to packaging and distribution with the issues where people can't come in to drink and eat and participate? Well, uh, as you know, the current challenge is getting beer into the hands of your walk-in patrons. And most of the microbreweries, the folks under a thousand barrels, rely heavily on either draft sales to other restaurants or to walk in traffic to their own facilities, their tap rooms, their restaurants, etc. cetera. Uh, number one, it's really to refocus the business to off-premises sales. I mean, that's going to be forced by our governors and public health officials. Uh, I know locally we have Tioga Sequoia Brewing, and they have a good amount of cans available that you can order through their website. And then they're also doing phone-in and mobile order pickup at their location where they can bring it to you curbside. That's that's great. That's that's exactly what you see over here with the folks who are succeeding. They're really getting it right out of the gate. And number two, where allowed by law, set up e-commerce for the brewery. So you're suggesting more direct-to-consumer through different mobile options too? Yeah. If a brewery doesn't already have online ordering set up, they should definitely look at getting that. Even if you don't have the fancy website, you can do something as simple as a Square website or even QuickBooks. You can set up a basic online store if you don't have some of the web development resources that uh, these other folks have done. And uh, yeah, that, that can really give you a much needed boost to meeting your customers. Three, make regular posts on social media about products and new packaging formats. A lot of breweries here are going to be going to big efforts to adapt to this environment. It allows a great opportunity to bring the public into that process, to show them what's going on. If you have a micro bottler showing up for the first time, make a post about it. Show the new cans that you're, you're going to do. This kind of thing, it, it helps build buzz around the products in the brewery, and it shows that you're still out there and, and active, that you have something to offer the community. Fourth, locate and secure contract mobile packaging services if it's available. Otherwise, you'll have to contract with a bottler or acquire your own to cover the off-premise sales. One of the biggest challenges 
has always been trying to keep that product fresh on the way home from from their visit. And the solution for, I don't know, two or three decades has been the growler. And more recently, we've seen the introduction of large format cans at, at some breweries, the so-called crowler, <laughs> uh, the, the 32 ounce double seam can. That's a really phenomenal packaging option for a lot of folks. Uh, Dixie uh, Manufacturing makes that. It's it's great. It has a small floor print and, uh, you know, the cost of cans is significantly less than that of glass and it keeps the beer fresh longer. One of the ways breweries are addressing the, their current challenge is uh, adapting to a more transportation friendly packaging format. The Crowler is an example of an innovation in that area. There's, uh, there's some other products out there on the market that are pretty darn good. I have a great little product. It's, it's called a drink tank and it's a insulated thermos that actually you can put some head pressure on. So it will hold pressure in the refrigerator and keep it fresher longer. And you don't have some of the downsides of oxidation and loss of carbonation that you see in the crowler or the growler because, you know, once it's open, it, it starts to uh, age and spoil immediately. How a lot of the folks are addressing this challenge is meeting it with more transportation-friendly packaging formats like the double seam can or bottles. There are some options in the Portland market, for example. There's a couple companies that are mobile bottlers and mobile canners. And for a fee, you can have these guys wheel their truck onto your property and reformat your kegs into cans and bottles and that's given a lot of breweries a lot more flexibility. I know locally we have mercenary canning solutions for mobile canning as options. And then in Oregon, you have Tin Man Mobile Canning too? Yep. And there's also a company called Green uh, Green Bottling. Yeah, Tin Man is based out of Clackamas. They'll come to your place and reformat for you. It's especially important for microbreweries that make not have the overhead to be able to can it themselves or pay to have a bottling facility. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, the cost of ownership on that equipment is relatively high and it also takes up a lot of floor space. And one of the challenges really is real estate, you know. Uh, microbreweries thrive on on traffic and high traffic areas have premium real estate. So these micro canners and micro mobile bottlers really fill that niche well because you don't have to have your floor space taken up with bulky equipment when you have patrons in there, you know. Those who got on board early on and already have that capacity are doing great. Locally, we have two great examples of that, and that would be uh, Hopworks Urban Brewery and Old Town Brewing Company. Those guys were ready to go with the cans way before this outbreak happened. And so it was only a matter of modifying their ordering and distribution system. They've done really a phenomenal job of getting their websites up and making it real user-friendly. And then um, this is more for Oregon. Our state insists that you only utilize approved carriers by the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. Currently in the Portland area, there are about 29 smaller carriers who can do this work and big guys too like FedEx. But those guys don't make a whole lot of sense for sending a few growlers across town or a few crowlers and a six pack across town. The OLCC does have resources posted on their website that breweries can use to locate these approved carriers. They call them for hire carriers. These are individuals and companies that have gone through the process of filing the paperwork and getting approved and keeping appropriate records of their transactions. I know some of the demand is going to be lower because there's going to be less foot traffic. What would you suggest for suspending production and purchasing and how will that affect the supply chain? Most of the beer sold in the U.S. is packaged. That represents 80% of the entire market. And the domestic market is really dominated by InBev. They have a 40% market share. Molson Coors is around 5%. Boston Beer is around 1%. 
there's really at the top there for most of the volume. Those are committed sales. So the malt and the maltsters and the hop companies that supply them, they're going to be doing good no matter what, because they already have the infrastructure and distribution to retail channels in place. So they're going to be doing good. It, it's really the, the little guys that I talked about before that are going to be struggling to find markets for their specialty products. So varietal hops and pellets and whole form. I really expect to see this crop year, bigger fraction of that diverted into extract type products and not available for use as whole or pellets. So we're looking at a short-term reduction in supply on those kinds of things. Craft beer takes up quite a bit of the specialty products from these guys, and I expect to see the ones who serve the craft beer industry primarily struggle the most. We had um, Omega Yeast recently suspend their operations. They just couldn't operate. There weren't the orders there. And yeast really is one of these organisms that needs to be regularly refreshed to be healthy. You've got about a two weeks of life on an auger slant. You'll see similar things to that in, in the keg, in the unitank. You know, two weeks is really all you got for viability. So you have to constantly be turning it over to keep it fresh and healthy. There, there are some ways brewers can keep their own yeast supply up by doing small pilot batches and maybe dedicating a keg or two feeding their starter cultures if they do feel themselves pinched by the supply of yeast. Uh, the chemical suppliers and the beverage gas people, they can expect to see big declines in orders while well, this pandemic plays out, but they're already fairly consolidated, so they should be able to weather it. You said Oregon Liquor Control Commission has responded. How would you suggest state liquor control boards respond in order to yeah. help out? OLCC has responded to a COVID problem by making the hours of operation ban wider. Previously, you couldn't purchase beer or wine after 4 o'clock, I think it was. You'd have to order before 4 p.m. and they've, they've extended out that time. They've also extended out the radius that a uh, facility can operate. Before, you had to be physically present inside the licensed facility to make your purchase and take receipt of the product. They loosened up the regs and made it so you could be within 100 feet, which allows for social distancing. Those were pretty good moves. The liquor control agencies can help micro and nano breweries by encouraging folks who have capacity to either become carriers or warehouses for the microbreweries and tap rooms that don't have a lot of real estate. Cans and bottles, they take up a lot more space than kegs in terms of just warehouse volume. It's much more efficient to put it in a keg than it is a bunch of bottles. And allowing other businesses to come in to fill that space, it's only going to help out the industry. So one thing that these boards can do is they can put all the applications online and make them prominent, especially for the warehouse and carrier type things. I think the liquor control commissions and similar could up their game a little bit by reducing some of the burden on becoming a distributor and a third party carrier of the beverages, at least for the time being. Currently in Oregon, you know, if you want to deliver beer to someone, you have to be a beer distributor. So you have to go through the entire application process. And that can take quite a bit of time to get approval. And I would like to see a shall issue permit system go into place where folks could take orders from consumers, consolidate them, and then do the gathering and distribution from various affiliated microbreweries. You see some applications out there and services such as Drizzly. Uh, we don't have that in Oregon because of our current regulatory framework, but it could be amended with the stroke of a pen. They can also make uh, approval instant, but keep it easily revocable. That goes back to about having a shell issue permit system. So you put a little bit of trust out there and you give people the tools to put this thing together and you just check up on them when it's needed. Uh, 
Another thing uh, the liquor boards can do is publish a searchable directory of approved carriers and warehouses. Currently, OFCC has a list of approved carriers up. That's helpful. Having a list of warehouses up as well would also be helpful. And putting in some kind of sort and filter feature would be extraordinarily helpful. <laughs> there, there's some room for growth there. Another thing these agencies can do is waive the bond requirements for warehouses, at least temporarily. And the last, getting the liquor control agencies to come in and modify their rules. It would be looking at the requirements on the application. Some states and Oregon prior to the pandemic required business plan be submitted along with the applications. This plan was supposed to address how they would handle checking IDs on delivery to the customer or maintaining the security of the warehouse, etc. Where they have these requirements, they could really help people enter this space by putting a sample available to the public and making it so they could adapt the sample plan at the point of application so there's not a delay or a rejection for failure to submit a plan. These are some common sense things that could really help. Additionally, relaxing enforcement of label requirements, particularly for the small brewers who, who don't have a regular draft line. So they're not in supermarkets, they're going directly to customers. These guys are going to be scrambling to get their perishables into a container, and they might be loading it directly into Brights and using a Sharpie to write on the can and might not have all the required statements. So putting a temporary stay on the requirements that they have, statements on the container like caution contains alcohol or alcohol is known to cause birth defects or any of these other types of statements that the state and federal government require. Having a little bit of relaxed enforcement on that would help out quite a bit. You would suggest that they handle it in a similar way that FDA handles food facility registrations? Yeah, and and in a similar way that California handles it too, yeah. Mm -hmm. So FDA handles food registrations by a simple matter of just logging on and entering your facility information. And after you've done that, you're approved and... Uh, it's just up to the FDA after that point to come in and check up on you to make sure everything's correct. That's the beauty of a shall issue permit system. It's putting trust in the business and you're just following up on a complaint basis or regular surveillance basis. And for small orders and consumer direct shipping, it, it just makes a lot of sense to open the field up to folks who might have a refrigerated truck around. I know there's a number of produce distributors out there. They're struggling to get their volumes moving again, but they do have this refrigerated capacity. And if you uh, move to a permitting system that was a little more generous, you could solve a lot of the distribution issues. Thank you for taking your time to talk with me today. Is there anything else you'd like to add or let people know? Uh, number one, support your local craft brewery. Patronize those establishments who've figured it out, definitely. Volunteer. You can also lobby your liquor control board to get more common sense measures put in. Make it easier for the folks who have on-premises license to get off-premises licenses. These kinds of measures can really help out and save the industry as a whole. Probably the last thing consumers can do. If you have money that you can invest, now would probably be a good time to look into buying some shares, bonds in your favorite brewery. Their struggles with liquidity might prompt them to sell portions of their company off or sell debt. And this could be a good entry point for someone who has a little extra cash to enter the craft beer market and support their local brewery. They all sound like well thought out options to help out local breweries and keep everybody afloat during this hard time. I think it's important to remind your listeners and the ways they can, they can help out. Not everybody's a craft beer fan, but I know personally, if this pandemic blows over and now I don't have my favorite little pub to go to, it, something's going to be missing there. It's very much a part of the community's little places. And I think it's important to try to preserve those.
Definitely. I'd be very sad if all the microbreweries locally had any issues because they are a mainstay. Those who do have online ordering, please use it. Uh, <laughs> those who, who don't, I mean, uh, give me a call. <laughs> I, I could help you set something up. I, I have a personal friend who opened a brewery about four years ago, and he's just he's just still figuring it out here too. So my my art goes out to them. I, I wish them all the best. I thank you for this opportunity to talk to your audience, and uh, thank you personally. This has been a great experience. This is my first time on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're in three types of media. That's that's incredible. Thank you for taking time with me today. And hope you can hang out with your kids now that we're done talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will join the parade. Go back to your lecture on multiplication with your kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Tara. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. That concludes the podcast with Philippe Cornet of Quality and Compliance Solutions. And my next guest is Ron Beglin of R&D Tax Incentives to talk about how companies involved in research and development can get some extra liquidity during these difficult times. Ron? Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. You're teaching me an old dog new tricks. So this is my first podcast we're meeting. So thank you. No problem. Thank you for joining us today. So let our listeners and viewers know a little bit about R&D tax incentives and what you do. Well, I've been in tax credit consulting for years, and so uh, we're, I used to own a payroll company as well, and I sold that portion off, and what really excites me is more the tax credit consulting side of that. So. Uh, what I have gotten into uh, is research and development, which is a permanent tax code that the IRS and fortunately the state of California offers as a federal and state tax credit that can actually be an influx of cash back to employers. Uh, this actual tax credit was actually established back in 1981 and has been really opened up for, at that point, for big pharma blue sky, lab coat, beaker type companies and through challenges through the IRS and that, now it's morphed more towards manufacturers. And so uh, they have stats that 62% of all the companies that actually qualify are actually manufacturers. And in this valley, since I'm here in Fresno, I'm excited to offer that for a lot of manufacturers. Definitely. Um, can you give us some examples of companies and their industries that you've served? Yeah, I have some really exciting uh, clients that we've worked with before. One of the biggest clients we had is a company that is up by Modesto. They actually are a fabrication uh, metal fam manufacturer for the nut industry. And so they work with a lot of uh, stainless steel equipment and what's nice is they actually had six full-time engineers on staff that created nut processing equipment for a lot of the nut processors. That's customized equipment for these processors and turns out that he didn't realize that they actually qualified for the credit. The nice part was is that we were we engaged together and turned out that he had gotten over $2 million back from the IRS and the state. And so it was the, uh, the perfect storm for him because he's an S-Corp, so actually went back to his pocket. So it was nice that he had, it was a big influx of cash. The one thing that is kind of an antidote to this is that he actually, instead of taking that money and doing something with that personally, he actually started a scholarship for his employees' children. So he really felt the asset of his his company was truly his employees. So he actually opened that cash up for uh, employer employees for their children. So it was a neat story to have. Yeah, a lot of companies are thanking their employees currently that are being heroes right now. But this would be an opportunity to 
truly show that you appreciate the heroes that are on your front line for your production facilities. Um, Absolutely. And then this isn't just for this year's taxes, right? How far back do the evaluations go? Well, actually, it's a, a retroactive tax credit, and they're, the standard answer, and this is without any other complexities in there, the standard answer is that you have up to three years from the, your filings with the IRS, so you can actually go back up to three years and four years for state. Now, if you've taken some other credits or some other anomalies that are within the law, then you can actually go back further, but my standard answer is three and four years. So when we do that, I had another case that we had a corrugated box manufacturer that uh, we were able to go back and uh, we got him a very sizable uh, refund back from the, the state and the franchise, or excuse me, the franchise tax board and from the IRS. And they were able to go back three and four years and we worked directly with their CPA to do those amended returns. Amazing. Um, and then you're going to be talking about this with other professionals too, correct? Yes. Actually, um, if you're leading kind of in, in we have a, a workshop that we were requested by a, I don't know if you know CMTC, but they're um, a resource for manufacturers that are a nonprofit that I worked directly with them and been appointed as one of their companies to work with. And so They've asked us to do a speaking engagement here this Wednesday uh, from 4 to 5.30. So I've got some guest speakers that we're going to discuss what the actual qualifications are, um, go over and uh, kind of talk more about really what the actual credit will do for employers. Uh, there's two sides to, and when I say two sides, two different tax laws. Uh, one is for startup businesses that can help reduce some of the payroll taxes that they're required by the IRS to pay that will help out startup companies to help reduce their cash flow or their cash payout so it'll help them keep their cash. Um, on top of that, you can also do the income tax reduction as well. So uh, we're gonna discuss that and so I have um, couple guest speakers you know, along with a CPA to discuss all the taxation and then uh, discuss what the actual benefit would be for businesses. Awesome. Um, and that's going to be a webinar, correct? That's correct. We're going to have a Zoom webinar. Uh, it's sponsored by CMTC. The, it's going to be uh, myself and Carol Burke will be the presenters. And then our guest speakers are going to be Mike Nemat. He's president of Nemat Incorporated. He owns a business, uh, Lean Solar. He has a, created a, a product that he have a patent on for the solar industry. And uh, so we also have Mark Jackson, which he is the president of Blue Dolphin Engineering here in Fresno, along with the pie shop. So Mark takes advantage of the tax credits as well. Uh, and then we'll have Adam Grzynski, He's a partner at Driscus Groom McCormick here in Fresno, and he's a CPA that will talk about the taxation and then what the benefits could be for businesses. Awesome. And the pie shop is one of the corporations in Blue Dolphin Engineering. They've been working to make um, face shields, correct? Correct. They've pivoted, which is fantastic. It's, you know, it's nice to see you here in the Valley that uh, businesses are reacting to the needs and just I think uh, the best thing about this valley is that people really understand and, and empathize with each other. So Mark has been a leader in this to create the PPE face shields for businesses and uh, I've seen some other companies that have actually pivoted as well. So it's a great story. Uh, um I know EJ Gallo up in Madeira was making hand sanitizer, and I think you said Riley's Brewing also is making hand sanitizer right now? Yes, Riley's is. It's great to see a lot of our local companies banding together to make sure that everybody's safe and has access to required supplies. That's fantastic. I also saw, just a side note, that um, 
the Central California blood center, this is different than manufacturing, but the blood center is actually taking plasma for people that have uh, recovered from COVID. And so they're the first one out of the nation that is doing this. So I don't know if you'd saw that at all or not. I hadn't. Thank you for sharing. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up for today? Just uh, I, if you wanted me to kind of dive a little more deeper on what the actual qualifications are or the actual credit and what that would be. Of course. Okay. Uh, kind of give you an idea of what we are and who we are is really, really uh, the CPAs and tax attorneys that actually what we do is do the projects for companies. And so we're experienced professionals in this industry and basically what we do is we use our proprietary software to actually produce these uh, studies for clients. And so what's nice is with our software, it makes it very intuitive, somewhat like uh, Intuit does to ask questions to trigger clients to give us the information so we can get the actual best case results for clients. And so when we do that, we actually uh, have a dedicated team that is for the R&D and then we actually produce the projects. And so what's required out of this is that number one, there's a, a four part test that's required by the IRS. And so what happens is, is that the four part test is not only from the IRS, but the state mirrors, the state of California mirrors exactly the IRS four part test. And so um, the four parts is number one, it has to be a new or improved business component, whether it be a product or process, uh, some process improvement, uh, technique, formula, or invention. And so now they must meet all four. They just can't do three of the four. They must meet all four. So, and then the second and third kind of blend together, but I always go, through these directly and explain to them that number two is there must be some elimination of uncertainty. So whether at the activity that you're discovering information to eliminate technical uncertainty, whether you're doing some type of capability or methodology, something is uh, the appropriateness of the business component design. So which then leads into the third part, which is some process of experimentation. So. In other words, when you're developing something, uh, you don't really know what the end result is. You have a goal of how that's going to come out, but there's going to be some type of question. Is this really going to result into the end result that we want? So you're doing some different derivatives or some testing of hypothesis, uh, evaluating alternative designs. Uh, some systematic trial and error modeling is really what that process would be. And then lastly would be, it has to be technical in nature. So there has to be some science to it, whether it be engineering, uh, computer science, um, biological science or physical science. So uh, unfortunately, uh, social science doesn't count, but so those are the four parts that must, and it's mandated, they must eat, uh, meet in order to become eligible for research and development tax credits. So typically what we do is we consult on that. We try to determine and look at what their project is. We get to know the business on a personal level, understanding what their, their process is. We do actually plant tours. Um, we do virtual plant tours now. And so we want to make sure that we're following guidelines with this and be, being safe. But um, then what we'll do is we'll just have a nice discussion with them to find out some of their activities. And so what's required by the IRS is that there are specific activities that actually will qualify. So we go through really what they mean. And so um, some of the areas we talk about is the qualified activities being some uh, design test uh, execution, some beta testing, prototype refinement, technical meetings, uh, technical writing, any research, any design build. Um, we go through the majority of it to try to find out who actually in their organization is part of this. 
So in that, what we do is we uncover a lot of other people that are actually involved with doing research and development. So, and what we're doing uh, all together is actually doing a reverse audit. So we wanna make sure we're building an audit proof product for the client. So if they're ever tested by the IRS or the state, we actually will make sure that they pass audit from that standpoint. So, and then, um, Within that, we try to look in at their organization and then look at the positions of all the people involved. And we try to look at a one up, one down position. We'll take the people within the direct research, whether they're, they're a scientist, engineer, a programmer, a subject matter expert, um, or uh, technical staff. Those will be your people that are really doing the research and development directly. And then we try to look at one up and one down, being that they could have some indirect technical support, whether they be a, a, a technical staff person or administrative, um, any researchers, data modelers, uh, anybody that's doing that, even salespeople. So, and then we try to look at the one up side of it, where it could be the uh, direct technical supervision, whether it be owners or any supervisors, any um, executive vice presidents, anybody that's involved with that. So, and that actually comprises part of the actual study. So um, we we'll do all the vetting to make sure that this passes compliance. And so then we move on to looking at exactly all the qualified research expenses that actually apply to the actual law. From that standpoint, we look at all the people that uh, are involved with whatever percentage of the actual research and development projects they've been doing. But um, what's included is everybody's wages as a portion of what would be the, the expenses, as well as if they've ever used an outside contracting company to actually produce this product. Uh, now, they must be in the United States and so uh, it's U.S. based, and so uh, we look at that. We also look at any supply cost. Um, what were the supply costs when they were actually cons that was consumed during experimentation? Um, as I mentioned about the client that used a lot of stainless steel equipment, the stainless steel is very expensive, and that's really what pushed a lot of the, the research and development uh, project up to a high number. Um, and then if the last part of it would be they can do any rental or lease of computers, if it's used with that, uh, they can also be included into the actual project. So, and so now am I rambling or should I keep, <laughs> keep diving more into it? Because I can go even deeper if you'd like me um, to. We're almost out of time for today, but it make, I want to make sure everybody knows about R&D tax incentives, how to get in contact with you, and how to register for the webinar that you'll be hosting. I would love to have uh, people join our webinar that would be on Wednesday. Uh, they can contact me directly. I, uh, my phone number is 559-612-4343. And my email address is Ron dot Beglin, B-E-G-L-I-N, at rndtaxincentives.com. And I can give them more information and then get them registered for this. The nice part is that we're invited by CMTC and we have went through Eventbrite for the tickets and I'd be happy to have anybody that is interested to join us on that. Thank you for taking time with me today, Ron. Um... I will make sure to post up some pictures of that on the show so that people can see all your contact information and a little more about you and how to reach your website. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thanks Thank for your you time. Thank you for joining me. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And one of our other sponsors, if you're closed right now and you need to revitalize your flooring and your facility, make sure to reach out to Dynamic Coatings Incorporated. They are FDA, USDA, OSHA, and ISN compliant. 
You can reach them at their Fresno, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and Oakland locations or go to their website at dciflooring.com. Next up, we just finished with Ron Beglin of R&D Tax Incentives, and now we're going to be discussing hand washing sanitation that saves lives. Here's a little bit of information about Ron and his webinar. It will be Wednesday, April 22nd from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Ron Beglin from R&D Tax Incentives will be speaking. Adam Krasinski, a, a CPA partner of Justice Groom and McCormick, will be speaking. Mike Nemat of Advanced Manufacturing and Lean Solar. And Mark Jackson, mechanical engineer and serial entrepreneur. Another one of our sponsors is the Cal Asian Chamber of Commerce. They're hosting a business triage center, so if you need some extra cash, you can reach out. They will be providing um, small businesses a way to connect with resources, navigate options, and they will assist you with a disaster loan application. Make sure to email Cha Zhang and Linda Thor at czhang at calasiancc.org or lthor at calasiancc.org with the subject line COVID-19 impact technical assistance needed or call them at the number listed and or visit their business triage center at calasiancc.org. Now to go on about hand washing and why now more than ever we need to be washing our hands. This content is from Safe Food Alliance. They have a full suite of food safety services. They have food safety certification. They have trainings. They have laboratory research and development. They have in-person, on-site, and online trainings. And then they also host the West Coast largest food safety conference in Monterey, Safe Food California. Make sure to check them out and go to safefoodalliance.com for more information. Here's some science behind why people are not washing their hands. So Vice interviewed respondents to ask them why they don't wash their hands after peeing. One of the respondents, Lucia, age 22, said, I don't have time to be constantly washing myself. I actually think we all clean ourselves too much. It can't be good for our skin, and our society is too sterilized, it's not natural. And Martin, age 28, said, I normally wash my hands before I pee because they're always dirty due to my job. I only wash my hands afterwards if I splash myself. And to be honest, I've stopped worrying about contracting things down there. And unfortunately, these respondents aren't the only ones, despite the fact that many people responded uh, about this in a range of ages and gender identities. And women and men using cubicles or stalls to use the restroom were about equal for gender. Women 91% of the time wash their hands and men 87.5% of the time wash their hands after using a stall. Unfortunately, that sharply declines for men using, using a urinal. Only a little over half actually wash their hands. Now, Here's nine times you should be washing your hands. One, before beginning work. Two, before preparing food. Three, before handling an injury such as a cut. Four, after using the bathroom. Five, after sneezing or coughing. Six, after touching your face or hair. Seven, after taking out the trash. And eight, after cleaning, using cleaning materials. And number nine, before changing jobs, handling raw and ready-to-eat food. Let's first put soap in the palm of our hands and then begin to rub in between like so. But as you see, there is no soap on the back of my hands, so I'm going to interlace my fingers palm to palm, and then I'm going to do the same technique on the back of my hands with each hand. And then you're going to take the back of your fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked.
and then start rubbing your thumbs. And then you're going to take your fingertips, clasp the fingertips in the right hand and the left palm, and vice versa. Rub your wrist one last time to make sure your hands have been completely covered in soap. Thanks for watching. That was a video about how to properly wash your hands, and here's the impact that washing your hands properly can have. So there are diseases that it helps reduce by properly teaching the community and their surrounding communities health. 23 to 40 percent of respiratory and diarrheal con and um, Gastrointestinal infections can be reduced by 23 to 40 percent by washing your hands properly. 58 percent in those that already have a immune deficiency. It also reduces the occurrence of colds and other issues by 16 to 21 percent and absenteeism in school children due to gastrointestinal issues by 29 to 57 percent. If you have any more questions and you need help setting up a hand washing food safety culture in your corporation, make sure to reach out to this contributor, Safe Food Alliance, at safefoodalliance.com. Another one of our contributors is the California Food Producers. They are having their annual Board of Directors meeting as a webinar on April 30th. Make sure to learn about legislative and regulatory updates from their board of directors, and how coronavirus is affecting California's food processing industry. You can find more information at their website at clfp.com and through their events website at foodprocessingexpo.org. We've covered food labeling requirements for manufacturers and updated compliance dates, how COVID-19 is affecting microbreweries, research and development tax incentives with R&D tax incentives, and hand washing and how that's sanitation that will save lives. Make sure to subscribe for content like this and more at wcismag.com forward slash subscribe for all content about manufacturing, food and beverage, food processing, and agriculture.